Okay, welcome everyone to this ECHT seminar on machine computation in homotopy theory. This uh, project is, a, is another experiment where we see if we can kind of uh, choose a very narrow niche within homotopy theory and be able to uh, attract a group of people uh, online to study this thing, I, to study this topic. I see that there are a good number of people here. I was expecting a lot of young folks, and but I also see a lot of of old timers like me here as well, and that's fantastic. Uh, so, uh, with, uh, with that introduction, I'll I'll turn it over to Bob, who will tell us about X and its uses. Okay. Well, speaking of old timers, I thought perhaps we should have started with a talk by Arunas or maybe uh, Marty Tangora, but uh, I'm happy to do it. Um, so, this is um, X and its uses. I'm not going to give talk about all of them. Andy and I were just chatting beforehand, and that reminded me of a bunch of things we'd calculated back at the Newton Institute. But I, um, the outline of the talk is the following. I'll start with uh, some acknowledgments because a lot of people have been uh, uh, useful in helping develop this. Then I'll talk a bit about what it is. Then this database that John Rognes and I just put up, um, I want to talk about that a bit. And then uh, there are other ways in which it's useful, even in situations where you might not think you need machine calculations because you've got a hand description that's actually pretty good. Uh, I hope I can talk fast enough that we'll get to actually doing some small samples on uh, in real time, and then uh, we'll be done. So acknowledgments. Mark Mahold and Don Davis actually back in 90, 1988 started asking me to calculate X to this, that, and the other thing. Uh, they were looking at MO8 at that time and related stuff. And over the years, Mark had asked many, many, many interesting questions. And eventually he started saying, you know, Bob, instead of just uh, me sending you the module and you sending me the chart, why don't, <laughs> why don't I run this stuff? And, and that was actually quite helpful. Um, in the early 90s, John Greenlease actually um, asked about the root invariant in the X level and I ran some really extensive calculations of X and induced maps in X to calculate the root invariant there. Um, along the way, at one point, Tyler Lawson needed code to write down the dual of an A module um, in the format that my program needs. And so he needed it, so he wrote it, and I've incorporated that. I've been, helpful. I've been grateful for that ever since. Uh, over the years, John Rognes has made an incredible number of suggestions. He's suggested a lot of coding improvements, suggestions, requests for uh, features, and also he was really essential in producing this database that uh, we just posted. Dan Isaacson similarly has asked interesting questions, and also just asking me to talk about this has given me a chance to think about things here in an interesting way. Uh, funding has come just a tiny bit from the NSF. I have to put them there, but maybe I should put that in small letters, but that's okay. Uh, the Bergen Research Foundation, now the Tron Mo Foundation, um, was helpful in giving some funding. The Simons Foundation over the years and the Newton Alice Wallenberg Foundation also have all supported this work at various times. Okay, so what is it? Um, it's just C code and Unix shell scripts. So this is stuff that was originally written in 92, rewriting a version, which I wrote in, 90, in 1988. And the fact that it still runs um, is sort of a, it's one of the arguments that I had in my mind in favor of writing it in the most low level form that was actually not just assembler code. Although I did write a version in assembler code back in 83, 84, because I thought, well, machines weren't very fast then. Efficiency was more important. Um, what it does is it computes minimal resolutions um, over uh, a connected augmented F2 algebra. Sorry, I'm slightly distracted here. The participants list is, is okay. Now I can see better what I'm doing. All right, computes minimal resolutions of modules over a connected augmented F2 algebra. Um, it computes chain maps, which lift co-cycles, and that gives you products, induced maps, and some brackets. In the case of the Steenrod algebra, it computes the chain map, which uh, gives the co-commutative Hopf algebra square knot operation. Um, it, has tech, it produces tech code using tick Z that produces Adam-style charts of the results. 
And that's designed that, so that you can incorporate it into your own tech documents if you use this to calculate something. So there's a tiny little tech wrapper and the rest of it's just a tick Z picture. And you can just cut and paste that into your tech document. And you can take an existing one and clip it um, so you don't even have to bother to generate a new one. It also produces tech code for stem-by-stem -stem summaries, which in high dimensions turns out to be useful to have. Um, and there are a bunch of uh, code to compute new module definitions from old ones. So for example, computing tensor products, duals, and then you can take a, a skeleton or a co-skeleton of a common module. Um, also, let's see, um, ah, there's something else in here that it can do that I don't remember right now. Anyway, the code is compartmentalized so you can add new algebras if you want. So the code that defines the steam route algebra is just uh, two or three little sections of it. And the rest of it works for a general uh, connected augmented F2 algebra here. And so um, I've never needed others very much. So I've never written the code for others, but it wouldn't be hard to do it. Um, okay, so what's it do? Given a module M over a connected augmented algebra A, it produces a minimal resolution through some finite homological dimension capital S here. Um, through a specified internal degree. Now by minimality, um, HOM from CS into F2 um, is really just X. And so that means it's actually directly giving you X. You have no more homolo homology to calculate. Now the module is given in one of two forms. Um, I should, rec I sh and here I should uh, give credit to Jeff Igo. His last name is spelled I-G-O. In his master's thesis, he wrote the code that reads what we now call a module definition file and um, uses that to compute uh, with, to, to do the calculations we need. Um, before that, you actually had to write a little C program to define your module. And so that kept <laughs> a lot of people out of, uh, of using it. And so this, Jeff's contribution here is really very, very helpful. So this module definition file, a lot of you may be familiar with. Uh, we'll look at it again later in the talk. But it just gives an F2 basis in the action of the square eyes. Um, and there is another way to present modules most people haven't thought about. But if you have a finite presentation of your module M, then um, the X code will simply start with that and compute C2, C3, et cetera. So from C2 and up, you'll have a minimal resolution. If your presentation is not minimal, there's gonna be a little D1 you have to compute uh, to actually get x out of this. But that's, this has been very useful in handling large modules M, you know, things like A mod mod A of one, you can just write down a tiny little, you know, you have A, a in degree zero, and A plus, you know, suspension A plus suspension 2A in degree one, and off you go. Of course, well, we can do that one by hand. But anyway, um, it may be, it, sometimes it's useful to have a resolution as an A module um, in the machine that you don't have to code yourself. This will produce one you can then map to other things and things like that. All right, so now, next thing, it, it computes chain maps. So if you've got two resolutions, a resolution of M and a resolution of N, then any element in X to A from M to N can be represented as an ahomomorphism from stage S uh, in say by degree, cohomological degree S naught, internal degree T naught, uh, can be represented as an ahomomorphism from uh, CS naught to suspension T naught of N. And from this data, uh, which is specified in a, what we call a map definition file, X then lifts X to a chain map, uh, you know, a set of maps uh, lifting this co-cycle. So the map definition file simply contains this, p this bit of data, the cohomological degree S naught, the internal degree T naught, the domain and codomain, and the uh, map X, which um, consists of listing the non-zero images in N of the A generators of CS naught. So CS naught's free over A, so all you need to know is where the generators go, and that's what you put into the map definition file. You then run a program called new map on that map definition file, and it creates all the necessary files in the directory where the resolution of M is located. 
Um, you then run do ifs in the uh, domain directory, and that then computes the, uh, the list for you. If the codomain is F2 and the chain map is simply dual to a generator in uh, C sub S, um, then uh, one command, cocycle, does both of these steps for you. It creates the map definition file, and then it runs new map on it. Now, here's a notation that um, we use for these elements. Um, C sub S um, has um, it, you know, its free module over the Steenwright algebra or whatever your algebra is. So we just number the generators of C sub S 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. So then the duals to those are uh, numbered uh, or written S sub 0, S sub 1, S sub 2, S sub 3. Um, and uh, that's, um, we'll talk about that more in a, in a little bit. Um, the chain map, here's an important point. The chain map will only be computed in the range in which the domain and code domain already exist. It will not extend your resolutions for you. Um, and if, uh, you know, th there are parts where the, the codomain or the domain don't exist, then it simply waits until you've defined them and you have to run do lifts again. The reason this is important is if you've lifted a chain map and then you extend your resolutions, you really need to rerun uh, the, the lift command to now compute the rest of the chain map because otherwise it will look like things are zero that are not. So uh, this is not the most user-friendly code. Um, so you have to pay attention. Um, those of you who have used this over the years, feel free to chime in if you have comments at any point, by the way. Um, I've included in the existing res, uh, distribution a pre-computed resolution of F2 over the Steenwright algebra through internal degree 120 and a resolution of F2 over uh, A of 2 through internal degree 300. And that means you can compute lifts for co-cycles um, pretty much through the whole range you're likely to, to need them. Um, Okay, so let's look a little bit at how chain maps work. The chain map lifting X in X to S naught T naught uh, certainly gives you the, the product map multiplied by X from X to S T to X to S plus S naught. Ah, notice X to S T of N going to X to S plus S naught T plus T naught of M. And that's just composition with this chain map X, of course. Now, it also gives, and this is not quite as obvious perhaps. Uh, it also tells you already the total brackets with the HIs and duals of the A generators of the, um, the middle uh, of the domain C here. And that works as follows. Remember, oh no, this is funny. I thought, oh, there we go. Yes, yes, here we go. Remember the total bracket HISGX is HI times a null homotopy of SG times X plus a null homotopy of HI times SG times X. Okay, so now these null homotopies here, the null homotopy of SGX, down here we have SG going from D to F2, and we have X going from C to D. And that composite um, has to be zero um, if SGX is zero. And so that means there's a lift U here from CS plus S naught to E1. There's also a lift V from D, well, from DS to uh, stage zero of the resolution of F2, the, the lift will be zero, but um, there's, there's a lift from DS plus one back here. So V doesn't actually come into play here yet. This asymmetry is not uh, is a little unfamiliar to some people, but it's a very useful fact. And this depends on the fact that we're talking about minimal resolutions here. In general, for any, uh, in any uh, co-module, in any situation where we're looking at modules over augmented algebra like this, if the image of the differential in the resolution C lies in an ideal I times C, um, and I lies in the annihilator of the, the ultimate codomain down here at the bottom, then this same fact holds. It, that's all it really depends on. So here it's just the fact that the minimal resolution lies in the augmentation ideal times C, and the augmentation ideal is the annihilator ideal for F2. 
anyway, um, so what is in this case, a, the bracket HISGX is just this composite HI with U. But think about what U is doing. This is the resolution of F2 here. So E0 is just the Steinrad algebra. E1 then has generators mapping to square one, square two, square four, square eight, et cetera. Okay, so um, what HI then does to E1 is it just picks off the generator corresponding to square two to the I. Well, how is that going to be visible over here? That's going to be visible by saying that the lift of SG composed with XS hits square two to the I in the copy of the steam rod algebra, which is E naught here. Now, why, how will you see that under just looking at the map XS? Well, the dual to generator SG here is just picking off the component of D sub S, which um, is uh, generated by that single generator, S sub G. So that means this composite HIU is non-zero exactly when the map XS here is actually uh, contains the term square two to the I times the generator dual to SG. And so that's, hey, okay. So we're going to say that again later in a formal proposition, but this um, is how it uh, Yes, I yes. have a question. Can you go back? Sure. Yeah, here about the total brackets. So um, uh, what about total brackets that don't involve an HI in the first entry? Yeah. That, <laughs> that's a lot harder. You have to compute null homotopies. The version I wrote in 1988 had null homotopies built into it. In 92, for some reason, I didn't implement that, and I've never done it. It's not that hard an extension to the code. I should just do it, you know, and then we'd have all brackets. Um, and that's, that's an interesting project. Maybe, uh, maybe we should do that. Um, this, this is such a nice little uh, uh, fact, though, that, I mean, this the stuff in red here, well, you should have been left out. It shouldn't have been in red. The stuff in red here, the map XS is actually telling us all of these brackets here though. So mm -hmm. you're getting way more information out of a chain map than you have any right to expect. Now this is actually a general fact. In general, X1 is always looking at M mod M squared. X1 of, of the ground field, the ground field is always telling you M mod M squared or M's the augmentation idea. And Anytime you're looking at products or brackets involving that, you actually only need, um, you, you, those are actually already visible. So products by elements of Coulomb logical degree one and brackets where one, the, one of the outside terms is in Coulomb logical degree one can always be visible through one layer of complexity below where you think they are. I mean, where they're formally defined. Um, Okay, so now this one of the cool things about this is it does give us a canonical basis for X over A. And so the A generators of C sub S are, as I said, indexed on the non negative integers in non decreasing order of internal degree. And their duals, S0, S1, et cetera, form a well defined canonical basis then for X. So in general, for an arbitrary module M, this depends on the chosen linearly ordered basis of M. But when M is F2, there's only one such choice, so it's unique. And this gives us a canonical basis for the cohomology of the Steenrod algebra, and we'll talk about that today, and we'll leave the, the general case to the future. So how do you do this? We totally order the elements of C sub ST by saying square R, now this is the Milner square R. So capital R here is a multi-index, R1, R2, da, da, da. And we're gonna totally order the terms by saying square R of SG dual is less than square R prime of SG prime dual. If G is less than G prime, or G equals G prime and square R is less than square R prime, where the Milner basis elements are giving what the, the uh, Grobner basis people call grev lex order, graded reverse lexicographic order. So R1, R2, da, 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 is less than R prime, prime R2, da, da, da. If they agree from some point on, and the first place where they don't agree, RK is less than RK prime. Okay, so what that looks like is square N is the lowest term in degree N. 
uh, square n minus three, one, and all the terms of length two are the next highest. Then the terms of length three with third term one, the terms of length three with third term two, et cetera. And then the terms of length four, et cetera. Okay, so that's the, in a way, the natural ordering. Very easy to write a computer, a, a loop that generates these in the correct order. Um, then each element acquires a leading term, which is the lowest term. Um, and then in the totally ordered, oh, just this is just a comment really. In that, in this totally ordered basis, the decomposables come first. And then the tail end are the indecomposables, the new generators, which are in, um, in, in lying in this actual degree. So now we can inductively define the canonical basis as follows. In, in the case of a general module M, this is where you'd have to make a slight change. That's easier here for F2. You start with the basis dual to the single generator of C0. Okay, so C0 is just a copy of the Steinrite algebra, and its generator is zero sub zero star. You start with the empty set for CS when S is positive. You can then inductively assume you've got the basis for CS in degrees less than T, and for CS minus one in degrees less than or equal to T, in order to study what happens in the by degree ST. So there are two steps into the process. Gen M Kerr generates the image in the kernel. We start with image sub ST, which is a total, totally ordered list of pairs X DX with the leading terms of the DX in strictly increasing order. Kerr ST is just a list of the terms uh, of terms X. Both of them are initially empty. Um, if you think about this, what we're going to do here is the DX is going to be a row reduced basis for the image and the X's are specifying a section to D. Okay, so we've got a, we're sort of carrying along an F2 section to the differential here. Okay, so then we consider the terms square R of S G star in order. You start with X equal to that and you compute DX and then well, dx is non-zero, if the leading term of dx occurs as the leading term of dy for some pair in the image that you've computed so far, then you row reduce. You replace x by x minus y and dx by dx minus dy. If the leading term of dx is not in image of st yet, then you add this pair x dx to the image in its appropriate, in order, so that you've got it in the, everything in correct order, and you go to the next decomposable term. Ah, sorry, this is a typo. The word decomposable doesn't belong here. The next term, sorry, cross out the word decomposable, please. Oh, a minor point here, but just to make sure I understand, we're working mod two here, right? So minus, oh, yeah. the minus signs are pluses. Uh, the minus signs are either pluses or minus, whichever you like. Yeah. They're the same. Um, if, uh, so then if dx is non-zero and this, you find that uh, its leading term uh, does not occur in the image and you add it to your image then, um, then you, uh, you're done. If instead it gets to, um, if dx becomes zero, then what we do is we just add an x to the end of the list cur st. Okay, so then, Notice in this process, the leading term of dx keeps increasing each time. And in, in each by degree, you only have a finite number of terms. So this process has to terminate a finite number of steps. Um, this is one thing that makes this so much easier um, than if you were working, um, if you were trying to compute the cohomology of a, of a group or something where you're in a, um, you have non-trivial stuff in, in degree zero. Um, okay, so the leading term of dx keeps increasing each time you replace x by dx minus dy uh, until it either becomes zero and gets added, to, and x gets added to the kernel, or it has a new leading term that you didn't already have, and then you add it to the image. Okay, so that's the end of the first step. At the end of that, then we add new generators. By the way, it's gen m cur and add gen, or these are the names of the program, C programs that do this process in my code. So you can inductively assume you, already, you have saved the kernel from the previous step. So then what you do is for each element in the kernel in order, you save that element, we'll call it C, 
Um, and then while the leading term of X is equal to the leading term of some dy for some pair y dy in the image, you replace X by X minus dy. So you're reducing it. If this process terminates with the leading term non-zero, that means you have an element in the kernel that wasn't in the image. And so we need to add a new generator, which will hit something. Hit what? Well, we're going to let it hit C, not the row reduced X. I'll explain that in a moment. So then, on the other hand, we do need to add the results of this process of adding this to our image so that we can process the rest of the kernel. And so we add a new pair Z comma X. The differential is going to be X. And then Z, what is it? Well, you take the difference of the new generator you added and those Y whose images DY were subtracted from X up here. Okay, so now D of Z will be X. And that gives you a new pair that goes into your image here. If instead the process terminates with, the, with X equal to zero, then you do nothing and go on to the next term. Okay, so that actually now specifies the order in which the generators are given. Now this second, th this interesting bit in red here um, doesn't have to be done that way. We could have chosen to let D of S G star be the pair, the element X that we got. And we'd just add then S G star X to the image. And prior to the year 2000, that's the algorithm I used. Um, but it turns out that if you don't do that, now that's interesting. How, ah, there, good, okay. Uh, if you if you do it the way I describe here instead, then the products, especially the S H I times S G, but actually all products turn out to be monomial far more frequently. It's, I, I don't have a good explanation for this, but it's true. Um, what motivated you to try it? Was it just, what, what made you think of doing, making the change? 2000 was a long time ago. <laughs> uh, good question. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Interesting. I, it could have been hand calculation. Because actually, I'll show you an example in a second. Um, the, I've distributed sort of on my website and also privately to Mark and uh, many of you um, a document that has the products in the cohomology of the Steenrod algebra out through internal degree around 140, I think. And it used the older algorithm. And the first difference visible in the X charts is in by degree, um, cohomological degree nine in, and atom, you know, geometric degree 23. And in the new algorithm, you see this monomial character, H, H1 times H3 is 9.4 and H0 times H4 is 9.5. But in the older algorithm, H1 of H3 was 9.4 plus 9.5 and H0. Okay, so those formulas aren't very illuminating. This picture may be more helpful. Okay, so you see what's happening over here in the older algorithm, this class four in Adams filtration eight, it's H0 multiple is the sum of two classes here. And then the H1 multiple of each of those classes is non-zero. It's just, it's just a crummy basis. In the new algorithm, it, the machine chooses a nice basis from the start. Um, so that was the motivation for the change. I owe this, the fact that this is the first example to Dexter Chua. He, uh, he asked me about this. Um, it, by the way, I should point out also, uh, I didn't put this in the text, but this does not change the algebra structure. The algebra structure you're going to get is going to look exactly the same. We're not going to get different algebra generators from this process, but we will get a different F2 basis. So that's the only real change. Just gives you a more convenient F2 basis in which to describe the algebra you're calculating. Um, it does change the resolution really, really early. If you go down to by degree S equal two, T equal four, already the old algorithm gives you the Milner basis Q1 times the generator zero in the old algorithm and the new algorithm you'll have square three there instead. Okay, now what have we done with this? Jeez, okay, half, half done. I talk fast, Robert. Um, <laughs> John Rognes and I uh, have been calculating for a while, um, and we've produced a data set of our um, 
calculations out to internal degree 184. Uh, together with lots of other stuff. So I'm going to describe that database now. And we've uploaded it to um, the, Norwe the National Infrastructure for Research Data uh, Research Data Archive. So if I click on this, ah, it worked. Let me briefly stop sharing my this and show you instead what you'll see when you click on that. Um, here's the archive. Okay, so um, you um, can go to search, search for the term cohomology, and you'll find our database there. Okay, so um, let me do one other thing. Um, let's see, let's see, do I, okay, good, here. Yes, here's what will happen. If you click on the document, the DOI for the document, you'll come to this page and you can download the data, the data set there. Yeah, and we're your... Bob, we're not seeing your screen. Oh, you're not seeing that. Okay. Right now. Well, we did you... see, I did, we did see the NIRD website briefly, but now it's. I, okay. I, I, I messed that up somehow. Let's reshare that. There we go. Okay. Now we've got it. Yeah. Okay. So this, if you go to the DOI for this data set, you'll see this and you can download this here. Um, actually, if you want to download it, you probably want to go to a slightly different version. Um, let's see, does this, you can still see this. Let's go to the search. Okay, let's type in cohomology here. There we go. There are two versions of the data set here. The 77 is the main one, but it has 32,000 files in it. It'll take you a little while to download all 32,000 files. So instead, we recommend that you look at, that you download the number 78 here because it has a tar file of the whole thing in it, one tar file. So you download that one tar file, unzip it and untar it. So that's the right way to download it. Okay, so let's go back now to the, um, uh, talk. Let's see, where did it go? It wasn't, ah, there we go. Okay. Okay, so why? I'm screen sharing, but I'm not seeing. Very interesting. Okay, Zoom, be kind, please. Um, try, try closing the screen share and try sharing it again, yeah. Yeah. If I can't see what I'm <laughs> showing you, it's going to be hard for me to talk about it. No, hey. We can't see it either. No, oh, we don't a... see it. Okay. Well, where the heck could it have gone? Let me look at all the web pages I've got, all the pages I've got open here. Um, ah, it went to a different desktop. There we go. Cool. Uh, okay. So I'll reach. How convenient. Let's pull that. Okay, fine. There we you go. You got it. All right. So, so anyway, it has a DOI now, and one of the virtues of the um, the NIRD archive is that they promise to keep this in place so that this DOI will always refer to it for at least ten years. Um, one of the things. Um, the, one, the goal was to have a stable reference, which doesn't depend on my Wayne State University web page or any other changeable source, and also to give you something you can cite that's actually accessible to libraries, uh, that's meaningful to libraries. URLs aren't such a great source. The internet's a little too, changes a little too fast. And you can just click on this DOI directly and you'll go right to the data set and you can download it from there. Um, so what the data set contains is the whole minimal resolution of F2 over this gene red algebra in internal degrees up to 184 and cohomological degrees up to 128. Um, it also has chain maps for the entire F2 basis of X for every single element in the F2 in our canonical basis in this range. It also gives a chain map for square naught. That's a useful way of simplifying the descriptions of the elements. Um, also, there's a document called the Cohomology of the Mod 2 Steenrod Algebra, and it, it's about 
25 or 30 pages long and describes in detail uh, all this information. I'll talk about that more in a second. It has the version of the Xcode that produced this data. It has a file all.products, which contains all non-zero products, a file all.sq0, which contains all the non-zero square knots. It has files p.txt, p2.txt, p4.txt, giving the atoms periodicity operators. It has a file mm.txt, not m.txt, because it gives a variant of uh, Dan Isaacson's Mahold operator, which is a very useful operator in, uh, you know, sort of grouping the generators of X into a more sensible fashion. It has an X chart for this range, and it has the stem by stem summary, I, which I don't have a picture of here, but it's a, a convenient thing in when you're looking at this X chart. Okay, this X chart is a little bit large. But notice it's uh, nicely zoomable. Um, let's see, let's look at an interesting stem here. Um, there, we might like to see the element G3 uh, here in the 92 stem, filtration four, all the stuff sitting above it. Um, and notice you, you have good resolution, although when you have it full size, it looks a bit uh, blurry and it takes it a little while to render. <laughs> so um, you can also see the cutoff, T equals 184 here quite cleanly. Um, actually, if you look at the Adams periodicity operator, you can extend this into a huge piece of the range out here um, just by using the periodicity operator. Um, so that you don't need, what you will have then is X by the periodicity operator. You won't have the chain map though. So. It extends it in a sense, but not perfectly. Okay, let's get off this hard to die, <laughs> hard to display page. Now, the document, the Co-Mod of the Mod 2 standard algebra is actually a, something I've been meaning to write in a, for a long time. So the completion of this data set, posting this data set was a very convenient um, way to get me to finally write the darn thing. It's on archive now also. And it has a description of the data files that contain all this information. So there are a lot of files. Um, it has details on these uh, total bracket operators. Jeez, my machine is making a lot of noise here. I hope it doesn't <laughs> burn up. Um, it has a description of the algorithm that I described above defining this basis. And it has a concordance between our basis and the previous notations. Um, a few comments about the operators, P, the atoms, uh, periodicity operators, and M. The periodicity operators everybody is quite familiar with. Uh, the Mahold operator that Dan Isaacson invented um, or suggested we look at uh, isn't of the form that we can calculate directly. So what we do instead is calculate this, what we call M prime here, which is just a tiny variant. We move H naught over to the left and move G2 into the middle. Now it's of the form we can calculate. And when they're defined, uh, they both contain this other bracket. So um, they give you a lot of information on M. This M prime gives you a lot of information about M. Now, um, remember how we calculated this. The chain maps allow us to calculate HISG, and I can't remember why I thought we needed this picture here. So I'm just gonna keep going. Um, ah, yes, I wanted to state this proposition. So suppose HI times S not G not is zero and S dot G naught times X is zero, so the total bracket here is defined, then it is the sum of all the SG such that the chain map X lift, the chain map lifting X applied to the dual of SG contains a term square two to the I times the I in the middle. Okay, so that's how we calculate it. Now, one point about this is it's entirely possible that that term appears in X sub S of SG star even though the bracket's not defined because one of these products is non-zero. So what we do in these files, p.txt, et cetera, is we give you the value of the bracket in the sense I define here. Not, uh, it, namely, I list all of these SGs. Then we give you, and that's part A of the file. Part B of the file gives you the non-zero products which would prevent the bracket from being defined. So you can quickly check if, it's, if that bracket really exists or not. And then the third part gives you the non-zero products, which give you the indeterminacy. Now, actually they only give you 
they, they look like they're only giving you half the indeterminacy. But in this case, remember, well, so the bracket indeterminacy is A times X plus X times C. But in this case, for the brackets P, P2, and P4, the right-hand piece, the X here in X times C is just zero. So X C is just zero. So it's only A times X, and that's the part we give. In the case of M prime, the X isn't zero, but it is divisible by H naught, and A times X is H naught times X. So it's already contained in A times X. So in all four cases, A times X is all you need to get the whole indeterminacy. So from this, you can then give the entire, you know the entire coset uh, that get the bracket is equal to. A uh, few comments about brackets. The notation PX following Tangora's 1970 calculation, seminal 1970 calculation, has been used for any cycle represented by B02 start at times X in the May spectral sequence. And the differential D4 of B02 squared is H naught to the fourth H3 is the justification for this, of course, but this is only half the bracket. In general, if you have A, B, and X satisfying that all these products are zero, then the Jacobi identity tells us that zero is in the sum of these three cyclic permutations of A, B, X. Now, if you let A, U, and capital A, U, and V be the, uh, the cochains whose uh, boundaries uh, show these products are zero, then the three brackets contain slightly different things. AX plus little a u, et cetera. Okay, this is this familiar stuff. And so approximating the bracket ABX by AX, just in the case where AX is a cycle, fails to distinguish between ABX and BAX. There's no difference between them. They differ by this middle term, BXA. So um, this introduces greater indeterminacy than you would like. And it also leads to some funny anomalies, like Tangora's observation that H5i is annihilated by H0 cubed, but P times H5i, if it's defined in this fashion, is still non-zero when multiplied by H0 to the ninth. Well, that's because if you actually go to our files and calculate P of H5i, you see that it's actually zero. <laughs> so it is annihilated by H0 cubed, just like it's supposed to be. And so by using these pre precisely defined brackets, we get good formal behavior and we limit the indeterminacy. Um, here are two other brackets I've always loved, dear to my heart, and oh geez, 12 past, I better talk fast. The complex bot periodicity operator, H not H1 X here. Um, I call it V1 because if X is the unit of KU, H not H1 unit of KU is exactly uh, V1 in pi two of KU. There's a mod two variant which reverses the H naught and the H1. So this is exactly the distinction we were just talking about. The, there's a universal example where you can compare them. And that is the atom spectral sequence for the sphere with two and eta killed. And in there, V1 and V1 prime on the bottom class are different. V1 gives you an H naught infinite H naught tower annihilated by H1, which is what you'd expect in KU. V1 prime actually looks a little different. Okay, so here, here's something I calculated using X. This is a kind of example of the small calculations you can very quickly do. This takes like, you know, five minutes to produce this chart um, using the code. And here you see the V1, the H naught H1 bracket uh, zero, uh, zero, zero down here. That gives you your H naught tower. Um, notice it supports an H2. That's interesting. The sphere uh, with two and eta killed isn't KU. So, <laughs> you know, if you're going to have to kill off some more stuff, um, sorry, you shouldn't have killed two. Uh, anyway, uh, and V1 when, prime is a different class here. Bob, when you said it takes five minutes, I assume what you mean is it takes five minutes of like human effort. And then, of course, the computer, oh. it's essentially instantaneous. Exactly. Uh, the five exactly. It takes five minutes to change into the correct directory, type the text files that define this, tell it to create the directories and run the code, and then create the tech code, and then run a tech shop on the tech code. <laughs> right. And then you look at what 
tech shop bid and you said, ah, geez, that's, I don't want to see all that. So you go back and rerun this stuff to make a nice, uh, an appropriately sized chart. Anyway, so this is, this shows the difference between the two brackets. They're, they're not quite the same here. Um, by the way, there are actually three brackets that were in the Jacobi identity. The third one, of course, is the sum of these two. Okay, so in the concordance, what we do is we present the relationship between our canonical basis and names based on Tangora's calculation of the May spectral sequence back in 1970. We also use Taiwan Chen's lambda algebra calculation, very impressive piece of work. He gives a complete description of X to S for S less than or equal to five. Um, in, this was published uh, in 2011. And we, I said this is named based on Tangora's calculation because we do two other things. We extend it, we extend his notation using square knots. So there are classes where he just gives a single name um, like P and we, we have a P0, a P1, a P2, P3, et cetera. And then the other thing is we adopt the Mahold operator names of elements because it's a much nicer name. And in certain cases, the Mahold operator gives you a class that's well-defined Whereas Tangora's bracket, def, uh, Tangora's May spectral sequence definition has indeterminacy. So it, um, it's not a, a flaw of Tangora's calculation that the May spectral sequence names are indeterminate. This is inherent. You've got an associated graded of the X you want. Um, so, and oh, so when I say we're explicit about this, I mean we say what the indeterminacy is in terms of our canonical basis. So you know exactly what the May spectral sequence name, what coset the name May spectral sequence name refers to. Um, also Chen's lambda algebra names, um, we relate those to our canonical basis by use of relations in X. Turns out, I mean, this is not a priori necessarily possible, but it turns out it is possible to completely identify um, Chen's lambda algebra elements uh, in terms of our canonical basis with one exception, and that's F naught. <laughs> this F naught in degree, uh, what is it, 17, 18, is a, just an annoying guy here. F naught and F naught plus H naught squared H2H4 um, aren't distinguished by any product that we have seen out through internal degree 184. Maybe there's an automorphism of the cohomology of the steamer algebra that we don't know about. Probably we just haven't gone far enough. Um, it would be lovely to have a more systematic way to compare the lambda algebra names to our names. And the right way to do that would be to give a natural homomorphism from lambda to hom C star F2. I'm ambiguous about what kind of hom I'm talking about here because I think I mean F2 homs. And a better way, I conceptually would like to think of that as uh, an action of lambda on, C, on, a, on a resolution. If any of you know of any such thing, please, I would love to know about it. Please tell me. Um, I would, it would be a very useful thing to automate if, we, if there exists such a thing. Um, and then here's F naught. We, you know, we define it to be square one of C naught because then you have all of the H infinity, uh, all the things that H infinity uh, um, operations and differentials have available for it. And so really this is the good name, the good, the, the good class in that by degree. And using Christian Nassau's clever method of computing square eyes um, by taking tensor products of small resolutions, of small, of, of uh, actual Yoneda, you know, ex extensions, um, we were able to, Christian Nassau and Sean Tilson and I calculated uh, the exact, uh, name of the F naught and Y here using uh, our canonical basis. Okay, so here's a case now. Uh, I've got, what, 12 minutes left. I think I can talk about this and we won't get to run this code. I'm sorry. Uh, I was pretty sure that it happened anyway. So uh, X over A of two um, is actually completely known without use of the computer. We don't need the computer to do this. And in fact, in our TMF book, John Rognes and I give a new calculation of this using uh, Davis and Mahold's uh, spectral sequence. Um, but in Enriquez's notation, it's got 13 generators here and it's got 54 relations. Uh, what John 
and I found in analyzing the atom spectral sequence was that it was a good idea to work over the subalgebra, which we call R0, uh, which is generated by G, W1, and W2. G is in the 20 stem, detects kappa bar. W1 is a lift of the bot class from X over A of 1 to X over A of 2. And W2 is V2 to the fourth. So um, it's delta squared, if you like the discriminant. Um, now, the atom spectral sequence then turns out to be a sum of cyclic R0 modules with cyclic, this is fantastic, with annihilator ideals 0, G, and G squared. Very simple R0 modules. And it's a finite sum, except that there are four H0 towers. So over, F, over R0 adjoin H0, it's finite. The differential D2 is not R0 linear, but it is R1 linear, where R1 is the subalgebra of R0, where you replace W2 by its square. OK, so then that means the E3 terms of sum of R1 modules. Turns out most of them are cyclic. There are three non-cyclic sum ends. Each of those has two generators. The differential D3 is not R1 linear, but it is R2 linear, where R2 is now the subalgebra of R1, where you replace W2 squared by W2 to the fourth. So then E4 is a sum of cyclic R2 modules together with four non-cyclic sum ends, again, with each with two generators. And the differential D4 is, again, R2 linear. So E5 is then a sum of cyclic R2 modules and three non-cyclic sum ends, each of which has two generators. So this gives a nice finite presentation over a very simple ring, um, this simple polynomial ring for the cohomology of A of 2. Now, why is this useful? Well, we want to apply this to calculate the atom spectral sequence for the cofiber of 2, eta, and nu in order to detect hidden extensions. So let's write m1, m2, and m4 for the two cell uh, modules where square 1, square 2, and square 4 are non-trivial. We then have long exact sequences in x with h1, h2, and h4 as the connecting map, and i and j giving us this uh, uh, bracketing the mo x module we want. And that gives us a short exact sequence where the x we want to calculate sits between the co-kernel of hk and the kernel of hk. So now, what do we do? Well, from the R0 module descriptions, sorry, of x over a of 2, we can compute the co-kernel and the kernel as R0 modules quite easily. And we then use x to compute the chain maps i and j back here so that when we take this kernel, I can, we can then find the, we know the chain map J, and we can choose good lifts, X bar, for the R0 module generators of kernel HK. We then use X to compute the R0 action on those lifts, and that resolves all the extension questions in this short exact sequence and gives us a precise description of the middle module as an R0 module. Well, now we're in good shape to look at the action of x over a, uh, x over a of 2, f2, f2 on this and compute the atom spectral sequence for it. So that's what we do. Okay, so then we compute E3 as an R1 module, E4 uh, and E5 as R2 modules. And then we get um, e, e infinity. It turns out actually for cofiber eta, it collapses at E4, not E5. Um, and so then we get a complete description of these. Yeah. And so now a couple other comments. We, we found a Grobner basis for x over a of 2 quite useful in some of the initial analysis that we used to uh, do this. But if you try to do a Grobner basis for, uh, I can't remember exact details now, but E3, E4, and E5, you just need to write them as a polynomial ring modulo and ideal and then do a Grobner basis for the ideal. Well, <laughs> this was hilarious. I actually did this. Um, and I can't remember whether it was E4 or E5, but you end up with something like 400 generators in your Grobner basis. It's just ridiculous. And the reason is it's, it's, it's an associated graded and there are just too many relations. Uh, it's It's too highly no potent. So the Grobner basis methods that were useful at E2 were not so useful in higher degrees. And in fact, just using X to calculate things in terms of this canonical basis was very effective. Um, I've used this same strategy to compute TMF star of this nice little four cell complex 
that exists because the bracket two eta nu is zero. Um, and that, oh, are there comments in the chat I should be responding to? Ah, no, they're getting answered. I will, I'll interrupt you if there's anything cool. in there. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. All right, so, um, all right, small samples. Okay, so what I was gonna do here, let's see, how much time do we have? One minute. Uh, oh, or can I go till 1230? You can take a few okay. more minutes. Yeah, let's try to wrap it up by 1230. Okay, so uh, let's let the cohomology of that uh, little four cell complex be here. This is M. And I want to show how to compute the module definition file for M, the map definition files for the maps I and J, and the one co-cycle defining the extension. Okay, so the obvious entries in the module definition file for M are it's got four generators over F2. They're in degrees zero, four, six, and seven. There's a square four from generator zero to generator one. There's a square two from generator one to generator two. There's a square one from generator two to generator three. And the rest of these numbers are explained carefully in that document, the cohomology of the Stinard algebra that accompanies the data set. And our X code allows us to see what else is required to make the module definition file. All we need are these things that are clear. Okay, so um, that's a useful fact. Now, the co-cycles defining I and J. How do you define the co-cycle corresponding J? Well, you just compose with the map from the first stage of the resolution for M to M4. C not uh, just a copy of the Steenrod algebra because M is cyclic. And so we can see the cohomological degree of this mat of this co-cycle is zero. The internal degree is zero. It goes from M to M4. We're going to call the map J. All that does is tell you what directory to stuff the data in. And then there's only one element uh, mapped non-trivially by this co-cycle here. And that's what the one here means. That element is generator number zero of C0, the only generator of C0. And it goes to this element, which is a name for the class zero in M4, the, the generator of M4, acted on by square zero. In other words, the unit of the Steenrod algebra. Okay, now for the map J, for the map I. Remember, I actually goes from suspension six of M1 to M. Uh, we want actually to define this on M1 instead, so we don't have to create a new module suspension six of M1. So what we do is we define it as going from M1 to suspension minus six of M. And then, so this, this co-cycle from D naught to sigma minus six of M has cohomological degree zero. Internal degree minus six goes from M1 to M, its name is I, and it hits generator number two. Okay, so remember, this is M1 sitting inside M. So we go back to look at the picture here. Ah, yes, there's the M1, the, co the cofiber two, sitting at the top of M here. And generator and two, and two is the generator, is the class that it's going to, uh, that this M1 down here hits in M. Okay, so now, what about the extension co-cycle? Well, here we have to just do a tiny bit of homological algebra. This is an X16 going from M4 to M1, and it's the E2 representative of the connecting homomorphism in the cofiber sequence. Okay, so that's a useful thing to calculate. Um, what do you do? You take your short exact sequence, you take the resolution of the right hand end of the, sh of the short exact sequence, and you lift. Okay, and then the map at E1 state, at uh, stage one of the resolution, is your extension co cycle. Now, if you think about M4, this is the cofiber of nu. So it's got a zero, it's got a generator at the bottom and it's got a square four on that, that's it. So E0 is just A, the Steenrod algebra, hitting that. And E1 then has to kill square one, square two. Square four is non-zero, so it doesn't kill square four, but it does have to kill square six. So there are generators zero, one zero, one one, one two, et cetera. One zero goes to zero. One, uh, one, one goes to zero because square one and square two aren't here in M4. But then if you look at one, two, it's going and hitting square six here in M0. And if you think about where that's going in M, square six in M, that's square two, square four of the bottom class. There it is, generator two. Okay. So um, that means the extension co cycle is going to send. Um, 
the generator one two star to the class in M1, which hits generator two in M. Well, we just saw what that was. That was the bottom class in M1. Okay, so the extension cocycle is going to send the degree six class um, one sub two star to the degree six class in uh, sigma six of M1, namely the bottom class. Okay, so there, this is what the resulting map file looks like. Cohomological degree one, internal degree six. Okay, so there it is, cohomological degree one, internal degree six, um, goes from M4 to M1. We're gonna call it E. It only maps one class non-trivially. That was class number two. This is one zero went to zero, one one went to zero, but one two went non-zero and to the bottom class in there. And now these three chain maps, give us all three of the maps in the long exact sequence. And if I had been able to talk faster, I'd have retired to the terminal window here and shown you that we could do all this in a terminal window in probably 10 minutes. Five minutes would get us the three Xs and a tech chart for them. Another five minutes would get us the three chain maps and the text files which describe them to us. And I'll have to leave that as an exercise. Okay, so quick summary. This code is fast. Uh, it gives us brackets and in, uh, products and induced maps. We've used it to compute this big database for the homotopy groups of spheres, which we hope will be useful uh, to people. Uh, it's useful even in situations like the cohomology of A of two, where actually we don't need a machine calculation to do this. We can do this by hand if we want, um, but it's still useful as you see. And when we're looking at all these modules over X over A of two, um, for low dimensional calculations, it's just, it's like, I, I gave a talk about this in Copenhagen many years ago named called a, a pocket calculator for algebraic topologists. And you can kind of think of it as that. The, the bad part is it isn't terribly user friendly. You have to be conversant with the uh, terminal window and shell scripts and stuff like that. And be, ha be handy reading uh, text files and things. And, you know, it's nice modern uh, user interface it looks like it's on its way. I think people are developing tools that will make that, uh, uh, you know, that will give us that in the very near future. Dan said some things about this last summer, so that were very encouraging. Um, and now the, the shameless self-promotion section. Um, I'm embarrassed to do this, but I can't resist. This took us a lot of work. Um, and the AMS promises to get it out by October 14th. Production date has uh, slipped a couple of times because they had problems with their machinery. Hey, thanks, Kyle. <laughs> um, and so they, they said that it's at the binder now. So this should be available soon. And there's a ton of stuff in, in here, um, more, th more than just uh, the atom spectral sequence for TMF. And uh, so thanks. Okay, great. First of all, let's thank uh, Bob. Feel free to unmute yourself and we'll thank him. Uh, Bob, do you have time to stick around for a few questions if there are any? Uh, sure. Glad okay. To. Questions? Um, I have one. Uh, this is Doug Ravenel. Can you hear me? Yes. I can't uh, see you, but I can hear you. Your, um, chart, that chart, does it, does, it, does it include theta six? Do you learn anything about theta six from that oh. chart? Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's go back. Let's see. What page would that be? Um, oh, darn. How did that disappear? Um, I'm sorry. I'm going to make this smaller. Art. Can you still see it? I still see. Yeah, your... it's totally fine. Okay. Let me get this out of the way. I can now change pages easily. I think it's roughly in the middle. Um, Where was this? There it is. Okay. I'll make this full screen again now. Okay, now I don't know what your machine does, but mine, st mine starts generating, uh, the fan starts speeding up right around. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so theta six. Um, 126 stem. Okay, there, there's the, 
next class that we're interested in. And all we have to do is see that uh, there's nothing in the column to the left of it that it wants to hit. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> so go back down again. The, down to the bottom. Yeah, you see around, let's see, around filtration 10 or so, there are several degrees where there's like five elements. Yeah. Up to 10 to 20 or so. Yeah, it's, uh, that, it's big here. Yeah, those are the, uh, the, the, that's the difficult part. The stuff above, yeah. once yeah. it starts to get a little sparse, that stuff's all under control. Yeah. But it's this, it's that, it's that dense part. And so it's a big mess. Yeah. Yeah. There's a, fortunately, this, uh, one of the things that, um, over the years I discovered, and Dan, you probably remember an example uh, of this, is that the product structure is remarkably powerful. So a lot of times when you want to know something in dimension, you know, 60, you multiply by something that lands out in dimension 140, and lo and behold, that product is equal to a product of other things you already know about. And then you discover further that the differential you need on that, that you can compute on that other description of the element actually um, involves multiplication by something that's uh, maybe not a monomorphism, but you put together two or three of them and you do have a monomorphism and you can deduce the differential. So the product structure is um, so far remarkably powerful in producing um, information like that. And I would conjecture, and this is going way out on a limb, but I would conjecture that if we knew all of the product structure of X over A, that that would actually force all the differentials. That all the D2s or all the higher differentials? <clears throat> you might need the, um, you might need the H infinity different D2s. Yeah. I'm 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 optimistic about it that about, about your conjecture for the D2s for the higher differentials. <laughs> I'm not I'm I'm less optimistic. Let's let's just say that. Well, this is just based. This is just a guess based yeah, on. Yeah. Uh, Looks experience. like David White has a question. Okay. Uh, yeah, um, it's great to see all this come together, Bob. After all these years of chatting about it, and it's <laughs> nice to see everybody else's faces too. Uh, just, I was wondering, since this is already being recorded and presumably it's going to be posted up somewhere, I'm wondering if you would be able to actually do that terminal thing that's only going to take five or 10 minutes and include that with the recording, because I think that would make it a whole lot easier for people to actually do this and, you know, use this tool that you built. Um, that was actually the reason I wanted to do it. Thank, David, thank you for the suggestion. I had already made a note that I was going to ask Bob to do that after after the talk. So I appreciate that. And there's two votes for, for that, maybe a, like a you know, a five or 10 minute addendum to the recording of the talk and we could uh, post it with a link from the ECHT, you know, from the seminar webpage. Uh, but we'll, Bob and I will discuss that, you know, behind the scenes afterwards. Yeah, or, or we, can, in, uh, we can leave it on if people want to stick around and watch it. I don't know, uh, can you edit that? Oh yeah, sure, we could do it that way too. Yeah, okay. Um, would, but before we, be we yeah, before we get to that, I just wanna, uh, are, there, are, there, are there other questions? Okay, I have one. Okay, please. Go ahead, Christian. And I was just curious what your plans are about, uh, what do you plan to do with that software? Are I, I still continuing with the computation? Uh, uh, yeah, we, we use it all the time, actually. You know, it's, um, and, and we're, we're pushing the, uh, the large scale calculation further, too. Oh, I mean, we play. Okay, so, including, including the multiplicative structure in, 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 in oh, higher yeah. dimensions. Yeah, 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 yeah. We have X in quite a bit larger range in um, the multiplicative structure. It take you know it takes a while once you get out to these dimensions because we're not using the clever algorithm that you use. I'm looking forward to your talk, by the way. <laughs> Thanks. And, and 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 do you have any features that you would love to implement in in, in your code? Uh, you I, already already mentioned the comparison with that uh, lambda algebra, which is one thing, but. If yeah, if you have any insights into that, I'd love to know that. I'd love to know a map from the lamb, an action of the lambda algebra. It's probably the, the opposite of the lambda algebra, but anyway, um, the 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 code for chain for null homotopies should be implemented. It's not that hard. 
Okay. You know, that's really ridiculous that I've let, let's see. Oh, for, for general messy products then. That for 30 years, I haven't written it. You know, I had written it in 88. <laughs> um, but, I don't, you know, well, I know why I didn't. John Greenlease asked me an interesting question about the root invariant. And then we started thinking about K theory. And then, you know, we started thinking about TMF. And, you know, there are too many other things to do. That's why I haven't written it. So uh, that's a question. Uh, yeah, I was going to ask, uh, whom do we need to pressure in order to get the uh, user interface uh, slick version? Uh, you got any students? <laughs> <laughs> um, and a little more seriously, um, uh, is there any possibility of, of this software getting put into a system like Sage or, or something? Well, actually, that would be a smart thing. And I do have a primitive version of it that I never really Develops any further. You could put a front end to this in Sage. It would just do system calls. And it doesn't even have to be incorporated into Sage. It would just be a little, you know, it's a little, you know, probably ten, five or 10 pages of Sage code. And you would tell it something that makes sense mathematically. And it would run the, it would do the shell scripts and stuff that are needed to extract the data. It would then reinterpret that in Sage terms. And it would be way faster than anything that you could ever write in Sage, I suspect, simply because of the overhead in Sage uh, accompanying these complicated data types that Sage is using. This is using bit strings. I'm just doing XOR of bit strings. Um, and so the slowest part in my code actually is generating C0 in high dimensions because I'm spending a lot of time multiplying Steenrod algebra elements. Um, you know, if I wanted to streamline that, I could speed the code up. <laughs> actually, and when we're in these degrees, like 184, actually homological degrees, John can probably correct me on this because he's better, his memory is better than mine, but the uh, homological degrees, like uh, sort of six to 12, or maybe four to 10, are where it's really, really slow. Um, it just, it's a huge amount of work. And once you get above homological degree 10 or 20, uh, it just goes like a, you know, bad out of hell. Yeah, that kind of agrees yeah. with my, you know, my intuition that roughly speaking, once you get up to the, the, the line where the G, G multiples are sitting, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, this lets align the slope one fifth. So at yeah. the 100 stem, it's above, you know, 20. And at the 160 stem, it would be above uh, 28 or so. Anyway, uh, it, it, it goes much faster beyond that. All the hard work is then kind of below in that, in that bottom, yeah, so which Kyle, gets bigger. But. To Kyle, to answer both of your questions at once, it, that Sage interface would, that Sage code would be a, a good user interface. I mean, Sage has nice graphical capabilities. Um, you know, the, the Sage is written, I mean, Sage allows you to do cool stuff for your calculus class where you graph stuff and you have sliders and all this sort of stuff that Mathematica does. You know, you could do similar things like that in Sage. Certainly a Sage interface for the code would make it easier for people to use. I'd be happy to collaborate with anybody who wants to do that. I'll keep that. Other questions? I have sort of an sort of an unrelated question, which is uh, just uh, the last the ending chapters of the Adam Spectral Sequence Primer book that you that is that you wrote several years ago. Oh. <laughs> uh, are they going to come out, or would you say that some of them some of that content is included in your new book? No, it's not. Um, it's yeah. uh, they're completely different. And uh, let's see, I have handwritten copies. Maybe I should just scan them. <laughs> I mean, I would, I'd probably read them, so. I bet you could find someone to type them up for you. Well, that's actually a better idea. Here's the problem. I gave 11 lectures in Barcelona back in 01, um, and they were base, basically those lectures. Now, as I was typing up those lectures, um, there's this balloon effect. Namely, what I had time to say in one hour, um, I could talk about at much greater length. And so, you know, the one hour... The, the, the tech for the one hour talk I gave for each of those one hour talks turned into like three or four hours worth of material or more 
once I started typing. And I don't actually have the self-control to prevent that. Um, if I were more That's disciplined, true. I could have just typed up what I had in my notes and it would have been done in 2003. Um, but I keep thinking, well, now I should say this and I should say that. There are also some flaws in it. If you look at those notes, my description of convergence is just dead wrong. Um, look at John Rognes's X notes. By the way, if you want to see some really beautiful uh, notes on the uh, atom spectral sequence, um, John Rognes's notes from the courses he's given on the atom spectral sequence are really good, much more thorough than that primer. But my, my primer's goal was not actually to give a thorough account, but to give a primer. That is an introduction that um, you can read without having uh, you know, it, it's 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 like uh, S.T. Who's little books from the '60s that introduced homological algebra. You know, and they didn't tell you a lot about homological algebra, but a, an undergrad could read them very quickly and get an idea of what needs to be done. And that's what I wanted to go into that. And I it, I should actually finish that. It's a it's a pretty. There are parts of it I really like. So I just I, thought I'd ask, but thank you. Thank you for uh, asking. I'd, I'd like to make a sort of a comment about this Mulholland operator stuff, uh, just to get the kind of attribution correct. Uh, the Mulholland operator goes way back. Uh, Margolis, Pretty, and Tangora studied it in the algebraic, in the X context, in the algebraic context, goes way back. Yes. My contribution is maybe I'm taking the Mahold operator seriously with respect to atoms differentials and the atom spectral sequence and what it means for homotopy. But uh, but but those are the guys that do really deserve the the, the credit for the algebraic and operator. Thank you. Are there any other questions? <laughs>